Нагоди 90-х роковин, Голодомору, мережа нащадків Голодомору та Світова координаційна Виховно-освітня рада Світового конгресу українців створили проект усних розповідей для учнів 8-12 класів. Ми пам'ятаємо! Сьогодні пропонуємо вам п'ятий епізод із цієї серії. Учениця Аделія Прокіпчук розмовляла із доктором Марією Коркач Грошко. Родина пережила голодомор. Adelia Prokipchak, student of the Rydna Shkola Ukrainian School of the American Ukrainian Youth Association, Mitrovitovsky branch. The interview with Holodomor descendant, Dr. Maria Krokach Groshko. Could you please tell us about the events that your family lived through during the Holodomor? On my mother's side, they lived just outside of Lubny, Poltavska Oblast, Lazirsky Rayon. And on my father's side, they lived just outside of Pereyaslav. So at the time, my grandfather was 37, and my grandmother was uh, 31, going on 32, or close enough. My mother was nine years old, and my aunt, her sister, was 11. My father was 14, and he was the third of four brothers and a sister. So this is the background of where they came from, and uh, the way that the entire experience with Holodomor started was in uh, the winter of 1929, in 1930, the Russians came and Roskulachet, which is uh, take away everything from the house, everything and anything that the uh, household had and anything on the property. She actually, with her sister, managed to grab whatever they could and they took one item each and they put it on their arms. One arm, the other arm, they locked fingers, they locked hands and they said they will not let go. And that was, those were the only items that were left with them when they took everything away. But my grandfather was a very clever man. And uh, even before Vone Prishnu Roskulache, they came to uh, take, do the uh, uh, taking of uh, everything away. My grandfather used to travel to Belarus. And in Belarus, uh, he managed to make friends. And he set up a kind of a lumber business. He was a man that did not stay only in the town. He traveled. Well, he heard all kinds of stories politically that were going on in the area. So uh, when they finally uh little school uh, my grandfather said, you know, we have to do something about this. And uh, he and his two brothers, cousins, and other people that they trusted, what they did was they started hiding coins, silver and gold. Where would they hide them? Well, that's very interesting because on the property, the property was relatively large, there were a lot of oak trees. So at night, they would make uh, ravines, not, you know, uh, long ones, but just enough to get in between and towards the roots of the trees. And they would put them in there, cover it up, and, you know, do whatever they needed to do to not have, leave any indicators that there were coins there. This was after they were at Roskulachi. Two years later, Holodomor sets in. They have not much to work with, but he, his brothers, the cousins, and other young men of the same age, they would go into Russia, across the border, towards the Northeast. And they would take a coin at a time, and they would barter it for food, and they would bring, it, bring the food back at night. And that's the way they managed to survive Holodomor, little by little. Well. My mother being nine years old and her sister 11, they were instructed not to talk to anyone about it. My mother and her sister decided they're going to walk into towards Lubne, and they went into Lubne. And my mother said that she was shocked as to what she saw. And she saw people uh, with uh, wagons and other people laying on the street. And she remembered one um, uh, individual saying, don't take me. Please don't take me, I'm still alive. And the one dragging the wagon with his friend said, you may be alive, but I have children that I have to feed. And because I'll bring you in, they will give me a loaf of bread. So that was one item that she never forgot all of her life. 
The other item that she did not forget was once they got into the town, into uh, Lubinet, there were people on the streets just laying there, rotting and, you know, um, swollen. And at one point, one of the bodies just burst open and they didn't know what to do. So they start, they doubled back and some older gentleman that was sitting on a stoop in front of his house said, don't go that way. And the girls, my mother and her um, uh, sister said, well, why not? Well, people that go down that path, I have not seen them come back. So they didn't understand what that could possibly mean, but they listened to the older gentleman and they went, took another route and ran home. That trauma that my mother witnessed has left a stutter for the rest of her life. What about your father's side of the family? My father's side of the family, they lived in Pereyaslav. And uh, I guess my, uh, my father's father, my grandfather on that side, perished from typhoid fever. So my grandmother was left with four boys and a daughter. And when Holodomor uh, occurred, my father was 14. And 14, 16, 18, 20, and then my aunt at the time was 21. So to help my grandmother as a widow, they would go from Pereyaslav, they would uh, get to Kharkiv, and in Kharkiv, they would barter my grandmother's jewelry. Uh, and then for the jewelry, they would get whatever they got, and then back again. But they never traveled alone, they traveled at least three, so that if anyone uh, decided to attack them for any reason, uh, the boys would actually be able to defend each other. And then uh, my uh, aunt, my father's uh, sister, she just took up and started, uh, left for Kharkiv totally, and uh, was hired by a wealthier family uh, to take care of the household. So that's the way they survived and also managed to get food and sustenance to my other grandmother, whose name was Alexandra. They just didn't talk very much about it. Um, and the reason they didn't talk about it was, I guess they were afraid that whoever would hear it, if somebody told someone yeah, and they would share with someone else, that maybe there would be harm that would come to them, even in Argentina and even in uh, Chicago. Do you believe that there is any similarity between the genocide that's happening in Ukraine right now and the genocide that happened during the Holodomor? Uh, yes, I do. And uh, in fact, uh, Holodomor was not the only genocide. Uh, we can mention 1929, we can mention 1938, and of course, 47, 48 in, in uh, mid 40s. But then that does not uh, eliminate the fact that we uh, Ukrainians have been in one way or the other uh, invaded and uh, persecuted uh, under Imperial Russia, under Communist Russia, it has been ongoing for the at least 700 years.